to the Mike Knox Comedy Podcast. I am your host, Mike Knox. Wanted to give a shout out to Brain Blaze Podcast. Check out that podcast for all of your epilepsy awareness needs. Also wanted to give a shout out to the fly that's in my studio that I just saw buzzing around. And we're going to have to take a break to uh, get him because he can't be here. Kind of like a giant bird, which made me think. I've been thinking the other day of... Now, there's this bird in my, uh, for the last month, this bird that probably around, I would say, 6.30 just has this, like, uh, very high-pitched chirp. And it got so annoying to me where I was, you know, questioning should I use a BB gun to uh, eliminate the silence of this bird. But that's the pacifist in me does not want to um, do that to a bird. But then I started to Google annoying birds and all these other people were talking about annoying birds. But then I went down the rabbit hole even more and I was like, maybe this bird is trying to communicate with me because I don't know if you've ever had a death in the family and then like a strange bird shows up at your house. Like there's a hummingbird in front of your window, which is what happened to me was somebody in the family passed away. And then there was uh, a very large crane uh, that was like the next it was staring at our house but it was like the neighbor's house and i was thinking it's perfect because that person that passed away uh wouldn't have known where i lived so they would be a house away and i was able to kind of put those pieces together there to formulate uh my own existence and i just thought it was interesting never seen a crane uh in the neighborhood i've lived in this house for about 16 years and then also there was a hummingbird that came to, uh, we're just call it my office window and like hovered right there. And I was like, Oh, well that's cool. I've never really seen a hummingbird up close, but that's never happened either. So I was wondering how to commute, how do birds communicate with us. And I started to think like, well, I mean, if you're, you know, in caveman times, if you're, uh, you know, you don't have GPS, you don't have a car, you don't have a bike or anything. You just got your club and your wool coat and you're going to see some vultures circling around. Well, you're going to know that something just got killed or something's dying or, hey, I, you know, that's the bird signaling to me uh, that uh, there's some food over there. It's probably a carcass from a water buffalo. Uh, but then I started reading about, well, there are other ways that birds communicate with each other, obviously, by, by songs and their companionship. And they've got, you know, the birds chirp for alarms like there's danger coming or there's certain body language that they have. Um, you know, they're keeping track of their friends and their family, a place to locate food, to stay safe. So then I started thinking, like, there's this crow that comes around, and uh, all he really, he's a gigantic crow also. Some of those crows get huge. But really what he's doing is he's, he one day, I left the garbage can open, and he was in there just, like, partying like it was 1999. And... Uh, he keeps coming back thinking like there's going to be some, you know, extra wonderful food in that trash can. But then what I did is I took a 25 pound weight and put that over. So he's a big crow, but he's not going to be bench pressing 25 pounds. And so uh, he still comes around, though, and he'll like jump up on the fence, you know, fly down on the fence and like sit there and stare at me and then like question me and guilt me into like why I'm not feeding him. But, you know, I also saw some, uh, you know, like when birds fly in sequence. What's that all about? I don't know what it is. I don't ever question it. So now the moral of the story is I'm questioning birds more is what I'm trying to say. Uh, I was watching yesterday the, uh, I think it's a great uh, uh, documentary named Shiny Happy People, but it's basically about the uh, the Duggar family. And uh, I would definitely check it out. It's one of those that you can fast forward through, but it just shows such a stronghold on uh, like a cult, cult-like atmosphere and it really just shows narcissism to me. And narcissism fascinates me. If you've been checking out my TikToks, I've been talking about um, uh, uh, narcissism a lot. I'm trying to go from the alphabet A to Z to talk about narcissism. And uh, because narcissism is not against the law, and it's hard to start uh, to um, actually uh, identify narcissists, it could take you quite some time to do that. And so I think it's important to then... Uh, getting over narcissism is all about repetition. It's about, you know, you've got to constantly go to therapy. You've got to constantly work on the fact that somebody has been out to get you the entire time, but acting like your friend. Collecting news articles for the past, geez, I think probably 30 years. And so I want to do a collection of those uh, about kind of like an old world news, or I was thinking about calling it hobo news. 
uh, and they actually, I was looking this up, they actually had a hobo news because hobos were people that were basically traveling from town to town during the Depression trying to look for work. So they would actually have a newspaper that would tell them, and it was called Hobo News, uh, where all the jobs were and where they could go to uh, periodically work. I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, I'm debating whether it's going to be Hobo News or Old World News, and uh, I'm still deciding on that. I still got to go through the uh, alphabet of the narcissism. But speaking of narcissists, and uh, armed robbery this week in South Carolina convenience store. Uh, apparently, the suspect was not armed, as the clerk thought, because when he was arrested, uh, and he was actually arrested at a quick, uh, quickie mart, a quick stop in the small town of Sharon. Uh, the man had a hoodie, a wig, and he also had uh, in his waistband a um, uh, the gun from uh, Duck Hunt, um, which. Uh, Maybe everybody doesn't know what that is anymore, but basically the Nintendo Duck Hunt game, which was um, when this uh, fine young man named David was uh, arrested, he had purple hair and uh, a very pensive look on his face like, I can't believe you would arrest me for trying to rob a store with a Nintendo gun. That's the look that I was getting at least. If you, uh, Mexico was arrested after he lost his bag of cocaine that he apparently dropped inside of a customer's hot dog. Now, I love Sonic, uh, just from the outside. I've never actually been in because there's not one that's near or close to me, but I've seen the menu. I like the ordering system. I like the name Sonic. I like hot dogs. Uh, I would not want to get some cocaine in my, um bag there. Also, the guy that dropped his cocaine was 54. And if you're still doing cocaine at the age of 54, and you're still alive, you, uh, you're a legend, because I don't know how you're still, uh, how your heart is still able to function. That's uh, absolutely crazy to me. Uh, what else was I going to say here? There is a uh, sailing race, and I bring this up because I was not aware of this, and I sailed for a very long time. I was basically forced to sail because of my parents, and I did not uh, like it or appreciate it. But uh, Simon Spears was uh, in this amateur racing. I didn't even know that they offered this, but it's uh, the Clipper, Clipper Round, the world uh, yacht race um, that was founded 25 years ago. And basically you can hire on, uh, you pay about $60,000 for your chance to sail 40,000 miles uh, over 11 months, which just sounds miserable to me. Uh, but you can be an amateur and enter yourself as the amateur and then you with your 60 grand get your captain and your you know your first mate whatever uh but uh i mean it just sounds uh, absolutely horrible um to me and you know a lot of people don't survive and don't make it um which i don't think i would survive either and um i just got to say that i'm glad that i don't have the $60,000 to uh spend on that because uh i can think of 60,000 other ways that I could spend my money much better than on a sailing race. Not to mention, you know, you get your boat sailing. Uh, there's just so many things that are... First of all, you got to pay for the slip. And the slip is like 10 bucks a foot. So you're paying... Or it's probably more than that. But back in the day, it was $10 a foot. So it was like $300 a month for your um, slip at the marina. And then you got, you know, you're buying sales, which are 10, the, one sale was like $10,000. It's just always stuff was breaking. You always have to, it, it basically is, uh, it, uh, you're just, you know, if you can come to the conclusion that it's okay to burn, you know, $100 bills, then then sailing is for you, I would say. Anymore, but I used to sleepwalk quite a bit when I was younger, and I was reading that some people suffer from sleepwalking uh, really bad, and Illinois man was apparently had such a problem, uh, the 62-year-old resident's dream that someone had broken into his house and shot him, and he woke up abruptly, and he had actually shot himself in the leg with his 357 Magnum. It's a very large caliber firearm, and that would hurt quite a bit, especially if you got yourself in the kneecap, I would imagine. But the round discharge from the firearm went through his leg and lodged inside of his bed. The uh, police said, uh, fortunately, this round did not travel through the wall that he shared with his neighbors. Now, uh, personal experience, I can kind of see this happening, especially if you are... I think when you have a... A firearm next to your bed and you have that already preconceived notion that somebody's going to break into your house then you're going to that's going to then go uh, i would say jump over into a dream about you uh somebody breaking into your house uh you know there's an intruder coming in you have this dream um and you're uh i guess we could call it sleep shooting now 
instead of sleepwalking. But there's a, you know, when you're in that REM sleep, that very deep sleep, uh, a lot of stuff is going on. And uh, that's definitely uh, something that does fascinate me because I don't have many dreams that I used to. I probably, I think I probably have uh, one, one dream a month where it's like that dream that you wake up and you thought that it was pretty real. And uh, then I realized that uh, uh, none of that happened. And it really is dreams of emotions a lot of times. A uh, San Diego City Council approved a ban on homeless encampments. I don't know if uh, your city is like this, but the city of Los Angeles, they basically let everybody out of prison and jails, and they don't have any place to house them. Uh, a lot of people are mental, mentally ill, you know, they're on drugs, um, and you're, you're getting a free check from the state every month, your electronics balance card, uh, and you're getting free tents and free clothing and everything like that. So it's kind of one big party there out on the street. I'm not saying that uh, I would want to live on the street, uh, I just think that there it could be handled a lot differently, but uh, I do think this is the direction in the right way where City Council of San Diego has said, uh, and it was just a vote of five to four, that's it, uh, that they are going to ban homeless encampments, which is what they did a few years ago. They always cycle in and out of doing this. They'll, they'll ban the, the, you know, they ban camping, uh, and this, that is... Um, I think it's a positive thing because you're banning, I mean, anybody can set up, a t say you own a home, somebody can put a tent right there on the sidewalk at the edge of your property. And I know in, uh, I think I've talked about this before, but I know in um, parts of uh, West Valley, in the San Fernando Valley, people have their tents uh, on the sidewalk up against people's walls. So, you know, you're trying to barbecue out there with your family, and you got people shooting heroin right there and on your sidewalk with a little tent hooked up there against your wall. Uh, so... Good for you, City Council of San Diego. I doubt that'll be happening in any time in Los Angeles. A, uh, this really reminds me of where we're at as our society in 2023. A uh, flight attendant charged for uh, calling in a... Uh, uh, a I'm just going to spell it because we don't want anybody to get scared, but it's a B-O-M-B threat. To uh, start her ex's vacation, she uh, allegedly threatened to blow up the plane to stop her boyfriend's vacationing to Miami with her new girlfriend. Uh, with his new girlfriend. Uh, this is, uh, these are the extent of what narcissists will do, especially, and I've got to tell you, uh, relationship wise, if, if you have to go to the extent of calling in a bomb threat to your, uh, exes, you guys weren't meant to be together. You can't, uh, the moral of that story is you can't force somebody to love you. And, uh, I personally have known that also. Speaking of getting somebody to love you, UPS drivers, those are the guys that cruise around in the brown trucks with the brown shorts and the brown socks, uh, they finally got their trucks to get air conditioned for the first time under a new union agreement. I had no idea. I always just thought they drove around with the doors open for like accessibility to your packages. I didn't know that it was because they didn't have air conditioning. And I'm not on ever really ever on the side of the union, but I'm on the side of this one. Give those guys some air conditioning. Jeez, especially here in Los Angeles where although it's been 3,000 days of overcast, today was one of the few sunny days today. But uh, that truck's got to get hot there. Uh, I, I'm my, I, The reason I bring this up is it blows my mind that they never had all these years. I mean, G UPS has probably been around 40, 50 years. Uh, that you've never had air conditioning before? That's uh, that's just crazy. And think about some of the places where it's... Uh, do they? Have, I don't know. That's my other question. Do they have heaters? I mean, maybe that's the next uh, union rep that we need to uh, talk to to get some heaters in there. Some people have been asking about what did I do this week. Well, I'm going to tell you what I did this week. I had a uh, comedy show Monday, Tuesday night uh, at the Comedy Chateau. I'd never been there, but that's in North Hollywood. A nice little shaped like a chateau, like a castle, like a chateau. And I think it's uh, I got it's got some very nice touches. Like it looks like you're actually kind of in a castle uh, when you're inside, and uh, it's got multiple stages. Uh, and it's run by uh, Felix. He's a very nice guy, and he got up there. What I didn't like, it was a comedy contest. So if you don't know about, about comedy contests, is, is they basically just try to pack as many people in as they can. I went in there going, I know I'm not going to win. I uh, just try to go have fun. But, I mean, there were 30 comics the first night. It went to, I think I got out of there at 2 o'clock in the morning. And then the second night was uh, kind of the same thing. It's just, And then everything else was great. They gave you a shirt, a badge, and everything like that. I thought it was well put together. If, if, if I had any complaint, it was that they didn't have a lineup written down. It was... They were picking out of a, basically names out of a bowl. So to me as a comic, that when I can't get up on stage and say, hey, give another round for you know Wally, the last person that went up, I, I'd like to write down their names to give them another round of applause and so people can remember who those comics were. And that was my only uh, complaint um, about that. And then my, my complaint personally was, so I probably got home about 2 o'clock on Tuesday night. Well, then I had to get up at 6 
um, because I had a call time for the game show Let's Make a Deal. And if you have ever heard of Let's Make a Deal, which has been around for 50 years, probably more than that, uh, probably, geez, I think they were saying 70 years, but uh, you get to dress up. And they explained that the whole whole way that that show got started was that um, they were picking people to get up, you know, to play the games, and a woman wore a red hat. And it kind of snowballed from there, where then people started dressing up so that they could get picked quicker. Well, this time, you pretty much just, uh, they've got it down to when you're talking to producers, you have to audition for this. You, you know, you fill out a couple pages about your information and all that. I totally understand that. That's so that they can weed people out because they don't want some crazy person in there because they're trying to run a show. And so I got there, you know, about 7.15, you're... You know, security checks you. I don't know why they're checking you. You're, you can bring stuff in. And then you're kind of single filed. Then they take a picture of you. They want to see your... They never asked me, which was another thing. You're not supposed to have like a... You're supposed to have a generic costume. So I went as the King of Hearts. And, uh, you know, I wanted to go as the Riddler, but I guess you can't... I, I read the contract because you signed a contract. And uh, so I was trying to be generic. So that's why I went and got that costume from the costume store. And uh, the... Uh, then the producers are, uh, you, you know, again, they're, you're, they're trying to weed you out or assess you again. So you're in this room with 50 other people. Then they're, uh, you know, giving you the pitch, the, how the show runs, what it is that's going on. Then they interview you again to make sure that you're not going to, you know, say the wrong thing, which I totally get. That makes total sense. Pretty much on for the entire time. So from 7.30 until like 4 in the afternoon. You are, they want you like up and dancing and cheering and that part I don't get. Like, so when we're in the very beginning, it's, you know, like eight o'clock, nine o'clock and they're like, okay, we're going to get you to dance. And they have you dance in front of everybody like you're on stage. Uh, I don't get that at all. And I don't want to do that. But then, and then they also, they're trying to get you to dance also. And I don't know why they don't do when you're on the set and the set's really cool and it's really cool to be there. And, but I don't get you know, they, they walk you to the set. It's not the first staging area is just kind of to see if you're, you know, going to be okay on TV. Uh, and then, uh, and I didn't see anybody get kicked out. Um, uh, so we, you walk over to the set and then it's the set's cool. It's the cool set. And then, you know, the, uh, the talent comes out, uh, and you're doing probably six, I think different, uh, games. And I got, I didn't get chosen for a game, but I got chosen for, I guess it was kind of a game. Uh, and, uh, then, uh, you know, you don't talk to any of them. You're kind of silent. You get like a 15 minute break in between the two shows that you're doing. So you're, you know, you're on your feet, you're cheering the entire time, you're screaming the entire time. So the moral of that story is I was exhausted afterwards. And, uh, there were other people that were very excited to go back. And I, I, I don't think I would go back because I don't want to have to get up that early in the morning anymore. Uh, but there was a guy there that was like, uh, 83 he won a bunch of stuff he was a great guy and, and that's what it is is you you end up cheering for the people that you're with and you, you're you're happy that they're the, the, you know there was one guy that came really close to winning a car and uh the two people that came close to very to winning cars so you're cheering for those people and you're really happy for those people and and all in all it's a really good day uh it's just that you know you're i don't know you you kind of uh you're very, you feel very exhausted because you're just a little, you know, you're the, you're the audience. So you're not, uh, what's the other one with the whammies, press your luck. And I want to go on the price is right. Definitely. There were other people that had been on those shows too. That was the other thing is there was one guy he'd been, I think three or four times and he was like telling me how it worked. So it's just, it's uh, overwhelming is the kind of the, how I would describe it because it's the, it's the fear of the unknown. You're going to be on TV. You don't know what's going to go on. Um, but I definitely want to do Pictionary as another one and because uh, uh, I want to be on one of my bits for my comedy routine is Jerry O'Connell. So it would be cool to be on Pictionary with Jerry O'Connell. Uh, quite a... So, you know, basically that was always a dream of mine to be on one of those shows. And uh, I did not win anything, but uh, I'm okay. I don't need anything. I just need this podcast. That's all. And uh, some listeners. And then I will be happy. But other than that, everything's good and I'm happy to try to go to the uh, UK, the United Kingdom there. And 
I've been trying to get my passport for the last nine weeks and I keep talking to other people and they're like, oh, it's so easy. I just walked right in there. Well, it wasn't easy for me. And the first website was a total scam that scammed me out of money. I went to libraries and post offices and they refused to do any of my stuff. And now it's just been, uh, I finally got it to them, the passport people. It's already been nine weeks. Uh, I, they won't, you can't call them because they won't respond. Um, they just, it just keeps, you know, it either hangs up on me. And I know that there's people out there that they get, you know, everything's wonderful and nothing ever happens to them. I totally understand that. But for me, this is par for the course. And uh, I've paid twice to have it expedited. So I've paid a good $300 to the post office or the passport people and there's nobody to talk to no response there's a website you get a number it says yeah we got your passport on 412 and uh then nothing else and they nobody will talk to each other it's classic government uh very inept and but there's no i don't have any way to complain um i don't have any satisfaction in making an amazon review for them you're just basically stuck there and then you're listening to everybody tell you how easy it was for them and then your family is blaming you for not doing it earlier and uh it just makes me never want to go and travel ever again outside of the country and they are making it for me i know nobody else has this but for me they're making it extremely difficult for me to re by the way to renew my passport also not to get a new one but just to renew it because i didn't use it uh in the last 10 years this is the actor paul lind probably not a name that most of you remember because paul lind passed away in 1982 but definitely a face you would remember because he was always on the hollywood squares he was uh born in 1926 june 13th 1926 in mount vernon ohio the son of sylvia lind and hoy lind who owned and operated a meat market fifth uh born among his six siblings he, uh, his uh, favorite brother passed away in 1944 at the age of 21 in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. Five years later, in 1949, his parents died within three months of each other. Lind graduated from Mount Vernon High School in 1944, where he played the bass drum in the high school band. He then studied speech and drama at Northwestern University. York City, taking odd jobs while looking for a business opportunity. His first appearance as a stand-up comic was at the famed Supper Club on... Uh, Number one, Fifth Avenue, he made his debut on Broadway in the show New Faces 1952, in which he co-starred with uh, Eartha Kitt, Robert uh, Clary, and Alice Ghostly. In a monologue from that uh, venue, the Trip of the Month Club, Lynn portrayed a man on crutches recounting his adventures on a North African safari. After the... Re uh, the, the uh, play, uh, Lind co-starred in a short-lived 1956 sitcom called Stanley opposite Buddy Hackett. Lind returned to Broadway in 1960 when he was cast as uh, Harry McPhee, the father in Bye Bye Birdie. I do remember him in Bye Bye Birdie, and you can still watch that also. Lind was in uh, quite demand in the 1960s during the 61-62 television season. He was a regular on the Perry Como show. Uh, he played along with Don Adams. Uh, he was also probably pretty well known for Bewitched. In 1965, he made his debut on Bewitched during the first episode, Driving is the Only Way to Fly. His uh, role as a mortal, Harold Harold, uh, a nervous uh, driving instructor. Uh, that was probably his character, I would say. He uh, <laughs> played a kind of nervous guy or a self-deprecating guy. He... Um, Starred in four failed television pilots in the 1960s. Howie, Two's Company, I didn't even know there was a Two's Company. Sedgwick Hawk and Manly and the Mob. So I think he was pretty well known. He got in some trouble and I think he was really well known for uh, not getting, or, or he was not, he was upset that he didn't get the stardom that he thought that he'd get. But I thought a lot of people always liked him. Uh, in 1966, he debuted on the game show The Hollywood Squares. That's why I always remember him. Very quick-witted. Uh, he became the icon guest star. Eventually, he assumed a permanent spot in the center square, a move that ensured that he would be called upon by contestants at least once in almost every round. So pri I'd say prior to the 90s, maybe 2000s, there was really a separation of TV 
film, game shows, things like that. Uh, different stars didn't want to cross over. Now you kind of look at it like, well, you had this regular spot on Hollywood Squares, but to a lot of actors that kind of bothered them because they couldn't get out of it like they'd be typecast for it. On the Hollywood Squares, Lynn was uh, best able to showcase his comedic talents with short, saucy one-liners spoken in his signature snickering delivery. Many gags were thinly veiled allusions to his sexuality. Other jokes relied on double entendres and alleged fondness for deviant behaviors or dealt with the touchy subject matters of the 1970s television. He appeared over 707 times. Wow. He also did uh, voice acting. He was in uh, quite a few animated cartoons from Hanna-Barbera, uh, most notably in uh, some of the Hanna-Barberas, which would have been like Scooby-Doo. I de- he definitely had the voice that you would remember. With his wealth that he earned from TV, especially Hollywood Squares, he bought Earl Flynn's Hollywood Mansion and spent an enormous amount of money on renovations and decor. He lived there with his beloved dog, Harry McPhee, until Harry died in 1977. Afterwards, Lynn could not stay in the home without his dog and later bought a new home. Lynn suffered from weight problems. I had no idea about that. Weighing up to 250 pounds. When he graduated from high school, he was honored with a Weight Watchers Award in 1977. He struggled with alcoholism, and I guess I do too. Had numerous run-ins with the law, including frequent arrests for public intoxication. I had no idea. On uh, July 18, 1965, he was involved in an incident... Uh, where he accidentally, oh, uh, his, which his friend, another actor, accidentally fell to his death from the window of their hotel room in San Francisco's Sir Francis Drake Hotel. I've stayed there. Lind and the 24-year-old James Davidson had been drinking for hours. Oh, Lind lived such a uh, on-the-edge life. In uh, January, or on January 10th, 1982, Lind failed to attend a birthday celebration for his friend, uh, his uh, actor friend became concerned and another friend could not get a hold of him after calling him on the phone and knocking on his door. They broke into the side entrance to his home in Beverly Hills and found him dead in his bed in an early morning hours of uh, January 11th, 1982. Lind was 55 years old. Stories circulated suggesting that Lind had a visitor at the time of his death who fled the scene, but evidence suggested these stories were false. Lind regularly activated his home alarm before retiring for the night. When they broke in, the alarm blared, indicating that Lind had been alone at the time of his death. Contrary to other reports that Lind was found naked, the two friends said not so. Paul was in his pajamas wearing his robe. The coroner ruled it a heart attack. Lind's cre- uh, cremated remains are interned at uh, interred at uh, Amity Cemetery, Amity, Knox County, Ohio, next to those of his brother Johnny and his sister Ellen. His mother and father and veteran brother are buried at the same cemetery. Like, subscribe, tell me who else you want me to see, and I appreciate everybody listening to the Mike Knox Comedy Podcast.